Hi everybody, this is Stephen Pugh, uh, City and Guilds Carpentry and Joinery. This is video number 11 and today we're going to be looking at um, saws. It's the unit which we call um, setting up and operating a circular saw, unit number uh, 211. And in this unit we're going to first of all look at the different power sources that we might have available to us as carpenters. The first one is, well, electricity. Electricity is our source. Mains electricity is always going to come to us in the main under the numbers of say 240 volts. 240 volts or 230 volts, that's very powerful. That's enough to stop your heart if you touch it. That's enough to actually power most um, electrical appliances. Your fridge, your freezer, your washing machine, they all can run on 240 volts. However, on a building site, it's considered to be very high too high a voltage so we have transformers now a transformer a bit difficult to explain but a transformer is a massive magnet it's designed to take the power of 240 and step the power down to 110 so everything that plugs into a 110 transformer is much safer if you get a shot with 110 you might feel it but it'll be fine you'll be okay but when it comes to um when it comes to 240 it's much more serious okay another precaution in using um, electricity is to use an rcd uh, trip switch uh, what this does is this is a very sensitive electrical device which when it feels a surge in power it will automatically trip itself off and it trips itself off so very fast that the electricity cannot reach you the machine is turned off before you even know that there's a problem. Um, within some workshops, the power supply can be 400 volts, which I'm sure you realize is very high indeed. Uh, it's a very common feature and it's used for woodworking machines, for things that draw a lot of power, okay? Um, <clears throat> when you're working with electricity and power sources, it's very important that you're careful with cables you can come into contact with the electricity if the cable breaks and the wires are actually bare. Of course, you'd need to actually touch them. But there's other ways. If a cable is broken and wires are bare and water touches it, then that water can transfer the electricity to wherever you might be. And if you touch the water, then you'll get a shock as well. It's becoming increasingly important to use battery power. I remember as a young kid, I, I was the first one in my group to buy a, a battery drill. <laughs> it was about seven volts and it took about a day and a half to charge it and it lasted for about 10 minutes. But you know, the technology in those days was quite in its infancy. Um, nowadays, of course, it's quite different. Now you're able to get a battery that will charge in an hour and last for 10 hours. That's a different matter altogether. Sometimes they'll last for two days. So there's different types of batteries and different types of, uh, literally the different types of batteries. So some are zinc batteries, some, um, there's lots of different varieties. I won't go into all that, but there's lots of types of battery now. And uh, as time goes by, the more modern the battery, the faster it charges and uh, the longer it will last. Um, some tools, amazingly, are powered by gas, which seems almost incredible, and that should be the so. But a small gas canister that you shove into the bottom of a nail gun, for example, there's no leads, of course, but that power in the gas is very strong indeed. It's a little bit like a cylinder on a car. Gas is uh, sent into um, a cylinder, and uh, a little spark goes into it as well when you press the button, and suddenly the cylinder just expands and pumps the nail out. So it's incredibly fast and incredibly strong. And we just need to be very careful that we understand and use these machines safely. One of my favorites is compressed air. I had a compressed air unit with me for many, 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 many years, carried it around all the sites I worked on. It was a small cylinder full of compressed air. Now, I don't know whether you know, but a compressed air is a very powerful thing. So I had long leads and I had tack guns. My tack gun was my favorite thing. It was able to pump a three inch nail right through a piece of oak. 
The nails were very fine, they were like a needle, but they could certainly do a great job and I could use it for everything, skirting, architrave, fixing things. And in the early days, if you, did, if you pumped in two crossways like that, then that would actually knit it together and it, it, it just quite frankly couldn't be pulled apart. It was very, very strong indeed. But these um, compressed air, they can be used for drills. I used to have a drill on my compressed, uh, uh, compressed air unit and they can be used for sanders. They can use all sorts of tools. They can use cutting devices. All sorts of things can be used on compressed air. Now it's very important with power tools that you go through the normal uh, safety procedures. You need to look at Haswa, Pure, Kosh and the control of noise at work regulations. They're all covered uh, in detail in health and safety in this in these videos. Looking after power tools. Now you need to really be very careful with the power tools that you've got. They won't last forever, especially if they're mistreated, especially if they're not serviced from time to time. You need to make sure there's not any missing or damaged guards or fences. You need to make sure that there's no damaged casings or handles. You need to make sure that the wiring or the plugs are not faulty in any way or damaged. You need to make sure that the switches are working correctly. There we are. These switches can wear out. And lastly, you need to make sure that the tooling that you're using is not blunt or dangerous in any other way. Um, when you're working with tooling, it's very important to examine them at least daily, sometimes twice a day, just to check that they've got no nicks. Make sure that they're working efficiently. These things can have a tendency of breaking. Amazing. And if they break, they'll fly. And so it's important that we make sure that we're checking them all the time. Of course, PAT testing is very important. PAT testing, it stands for Powered Appliance Testing. And those who do the PAT, PAT, PAT testing, they have little stickers that they put generally onto the plugs. And on the plug, it'll say in red, fail, do not use. Or it'll say pass, electrical safety test. And it will have the date. It will have the appliance number. It will have the test engineer's signature or his number. And it'll also say the next time that it's due to be tested. Now, these things are exceptionally important. It's very important that you're not using tools that have not been PAT tested because the PAT test will tell you whether they're working effectively or not. Now we, look, we need to look at power saws. The first one we're going to look at is the handheld circular saw. I expect you've all looked at one of these machines and some of you may have been using one. But obviously um, a small powered um, handheld circular saw is an incredibly useful tool. It doesn't have to be big, it can be quite small. And nowadays they're even coming in versions where they've got a battery power. But you need to just be a bit careful about that. Sometimes the battery power can drop off suddenly and the blade will just stop. So you know you just need to remember that this battery powered. The most important thing you need to know about a circular saw is that there is what's called a riving knife. Now this is a blade which sticks out at the back end of the saw and it is one tenth bigger than the saw. Now this has the effect of spreading the wood after it's been cut, spreading the wood a little bit so that as you're cutting through, so the wood is being opened up. It's very important that riving knife is never taken off. Very important. That riving knife, it, it, it just enables the wood to be parted and enables the saw to keep cutting without getting stuck. If a saw gets stuck when it's in full power, then an accident is likely to be occurring. You also need to make sure that when you're cutting, the, the, the blades will cut through timber. And if you're cutting on across a table, you need to remember that the blade's going to come through the bottom and you don't want it to be cutting the table in half. You know, it's very funny. You can cut down the middle of a table and it just falls into two pieces. So, no, we, we need to work in such a way. Just in the last college where I was working, they had a special table that I made there. And all you had to do when you wanted to do, use a circular saw uh, to cut timber down, all you did is take the lid off the table and you had a series of vertical pieces where you could lay your timber on it and you could cut down. And uh, what would it do? It'd take a tiny nick occasionally out of one of these vertical pieces. But 
um, those could all be replaced. And that was an exceptionally convenient way of holding and cutting timber. Now, <clears throat> saw blades. There are um, three different types of saw blades in the main. There's TCT, there's HSS and PCD. Now, TC, TCT, first of all, this is tungsten carbide tips. These are ordinary saws, but they have a tip on them that's very, very hard. In fact, it's so hard that it's harder than steel. And uh, these little tips, they, they do not wear out very quickly at all. They'll stay sharp for a long time. So that's the purpose. They're very brittle, okay? Uh, they're usually just bonded or glued onto the steel body. Um, and they're, 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 they're the classic, you know, they've been used for 45 years, 50 years maybe. Um, HSS steel is just basically high, high speed steel. It's much cheaper material. The blades can actually be filed by yourself to keep them sharp. You know, that's a, that's a skill all in its own right. But H, uh, high speed steel is a much cheaper alternative. And in fact, in some senses, I prefer it. Uh, and then, of course, there's P. CD, PCD, okay, that stands for polycrystalline diamond. Now these um, have industrial diamonds bonded into the surface, which make them very hard wearing. Diamond's one of the hardest substances known to man. Um, and what they'll do, they'll make diamonds in a very, very finely powdered form, and then they'll stick it to the surface. Anything that goes near it gets cut by those little diamond shards. If you could see them through a microscope, they would look like a lot of bits of diamonds sticking up, looking at you. So, you know, these are very, very tough things and they're able to cut through very hard wearing substances. Now, when it comes to changing circular saw blades, it's very important that you put the right blade into the right machine. And there's two different types of blade. I'm going to actually draw a picture because this is pretty hard to explain entirely without a diagram. So I'm going to show you two different teeth. Um, let me, there we are. There's the first one. So there's a tooth going up. Okay. Um, now there's the first one. Okay. You see that? So there's the tip, of course, just there. And you'll see how the tip leans forward. It leans forward on this angle. This line here is the line that would take you to the center of the saw. Now you'll see then immediately that from the center of the saw, every tooth is leaning forward. That's what's called a positive hook. Positive hook. Okay, positive hook. Now then, there are other types of saws and they lean backwards. I'll try and draw that for you because it's a little bit tricky to understand it without seeing it. Okay, so this type of saw looks like this. Um, and the front of this I don't know whether I've drawn that. I don't know whether I've drawn that very well, but there we are. So there's the front of the tooth, and you can see how that it leans backwards. In fact, this second line is the one that goes down to the middle of the saw. So these are called a negative hook. And it's very, very important that negative hooks, uh, negative, negative hook saws, are ones that are put onto cross cut cross-cut uh, um, cross cut, um, cutting. If you're going to be coming across timber, it's a very classic mistake. You see this in lots of colleges, in lots of workshops, whereby on the, on the radial arm saw, that as it comes across the timber, you'll feel it pushing its way towards you. It's, it's walking quickly across the wood. And that's because it generally has the wrong blade in. It has a blade that has a positive hook. So it wants to grab hold of the wood quickly and it wants to move quickly. What we need to do is change the blade for a negative blade. When it's got a negative blade, it means that you will have to deliberately pull it across the wood. It won't want to come across just by itself. You'll pull it across and then of course, it will return. Now, this is not an optional thing. 
This is a legal requirement. And all colleges and workshops need to take very, very careful attention to this to make sure that if there's an accident, that at least they haven't got the wrong blade in. Okay. Um, changing a saw is a relatively simple thing. I haven't got lots of pictures to show you, but it's a very simple thing. And it's, it's very important that as joiners, we become familiar with all the different types of saw blades and also that we become familiar with how to pop a blade out and put it back in again. OK, as you're taking a blade out or putting a blade back in, if it's a different size, sometimes you need to make sure the riving knife is adjusted and always put back into place. It's one of the habits, a bad habit of joiners to take a riving knife off. OK, to take a riving knife off a saw. Sometimes the riving knife is the thing that holds a guard. If you take a riving knife off a saw, then you're really asking for trouble because if the saw's down quite low and if the wood lifts a little bit, that blade is going to grab hold of the wood and throw it at you. So that's very important that we keep the riving knife in place. Now, one of the, one of the saws that uh, is one of my favourites is called the chop saw. I have a chop saw in my workshop, quite a nice one, quite a big one. Um, and it's made by a French firm. It's called uh, an Evolution. What's interesting about those types of blades and those types of machines is they run at a much slower speed. And also they have a special blade which enables the machine to cut straight through um, nails and cut through, through screws and cut straight through steel girders. You can cut through a steel girder and then carry on cutting wood. It's a specially designed blade to enable it to do that. So chop saws are wonderful things, fantastic thing. Some people call them mitre saws because they can be moved to cut at different angles. What I will say is this, it's also probably one of the most dangerous. Now the reason why it's dangerous isn't because there's anything special about the blades or anything. It's because the machine is designed as you lower the chop saw, the guard, the blade guard automatically comes out of the way. Now that means that by the time the saw is in its lowest position, there is a large space where it's, it can cut anything. And of course, people buy saws so they have a really good opening and a really good cutting. You don't want to be having a, a chop saw that only cuts that amount. You want to have a chop saw that cuts a large amount. So you can put large pieces in occasionally if you need to. Well, the problem with that is this. If you're not careful, you have your whole heart, arm in there and cut the whole arm off. That's, that just shows how very dangerous those machines can be. The other thing that's important about chop saws is that actually if you buy a little one, you can get little little mini versions for, I don't know, 20 quid or whatever from B&Q or from somewhere like that. They don't cost very much, but you have to have your hand a lot nearer to the blade. The bigger the machine is, the farther you can put your hand away. And the smaller the machine is, the more uh, dangerous it could be. The great thing about them is that not only do they do angle cuts, but they can also be tipped over and do multiple angle cuts. So instead of just doing an angle cut at say 45 degrees, they can also have a 45 degrees plus a 10% angle as well. So this is this is this is really really useful, and uh, that's that's why you know we 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 recommend that. Um, that people become really, really familiar with using a chop saw. Chop saws will save a tremendous amount of time. However, we need to remember that it is a saw. It is a circular saw. Therefore, it must come under the general rules of the Woodworking Machine Act of 1974, I think it is, 1974, and also of the Pure Regulations, which were just quite recent. I think that pretty well covers the whole of the subject of um, of chop saws. We've talked about how dangerous they can be. We talked about how great they can be. They are an exceptionally useful tool, but they just need to be in the right hands. You need to have confidence, but you need to have sufficient wisdom to keep yourself really safe. And you need to have a certain amount of presence of mind. You can't be listening to the radio while you're doing a chop saw. You can't be listening to your mate shouting to you across the room. You need to be able to concentrate on what you're doing and not be distracted. Anybody, anybody that comes anywhere near you when you're working on a chop saw should be told to buzz off. 
because while you're working on that shop show, you don't want anybody to call your name or distract you. Very important that you concentrate and keep your fingers safe. An experienced carpenter at the end of his life should be able to go to the pub and order five beers like that and have all the fingers still there at the end. You know, I've been into so many workshops in which people have had little digits taken off or they say, yes, I'll have five, please. And you realise they've got a bit missing. And it's just because of a moment, just a moment whereby something just happened and the saw took a digit off their hand. So I can't emphasise this enough. Be careful out there. These machines can be dangerous. And uh, anyway, we look forward to speaking to you on the next video. We're going to carry on talking about different types of saws. We're going to start next time with the jigsaw. So have a good day. Look forward to catching up with you on the next video. Bye for now.